Okay, so welcome back to the panel discussion on demand response, dynamic pricing. Uh, we had a very powerful keynote presentation in which you saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you were informed on some topics that you can pick up based on your skill set and do something about the various things that Ahmed shared with you. This is not something that one individual can do. This has to be a mass movement. But it can't be a mass movement of ill-informed people. It has to be a mass movement of people with a vision, a shared vision, and the courage and the stamina to deal with the forces that are out there that are countering this. And I have to tell you that education is a key part in reducing those barriers or removing them ultimately. Because people come from different mindsets. They have different preconceived notions. And whenever you're having a dialogue with someone, you're going to very quickly find out it turns into a discussion where you're literally banging your ideas on them and they're banging their ideas on you. And this is why the word discussion has the same etymological root as percussion. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but that's exactly why the word discussion has that base. Because it is a form of communication that is used in Western culture to dominate. So you bang, bang, bang the person until they submit and they say, I agree. As opposed to dialogue, which is comes from dia logos, the Greek, which means the flow of ideas, where what you're saying is received on the other side to modify their way of thinking so that when they respond to you, they have already built into it your perspective. And the presence of this model, you don't have to go very far. All you have to do is go to a Native American reservation and see the way the elders come up with decisions on matters that affect their community. They use dialogue. So quite often in our business world, we use the word discussion and dialogue back and forth interchangeably. They're totally different things. So I think that for making dynamic pricing and demand response a reality en masse in the levels of 20% and greater, we will have to engage in an active dialogue with the various stakeholders and educate them without being arrogant, without being haughty, but with humility, educating them so that those barriers that they have erected around themselves to any kind of change can be reduced. And I saw that happening in the Clash of the Titans uh, <laughs> episode <laughs> in San Francisco a little over a year ago, that there were many uh, ideas and, and data that was just not correct. And when the correct data was put in front of certain people, they acknowledged and said, yes, you know, there may be another way of looking at this. So this is why we have to spend not a few minutes in a conference that is um, attended by people who can afford $1,500 uh, registration fees and airline tickets. And it has to be done in as free a forum as possible because all stakeholders don't have the same size of pockets, and yet their opinions are just as important. And so I am taking the element of plausible deniability away from this industry. By creating this free forum, it's not about me. It's about as good as the ideas are that are shared. I'm just a facilitator in this process. And my hope, and this is why I do it as a free national service, because it is our duty. Because I, you know, when I look at our energy uh, market today in the United States, I, it's reminding me of the Disney cartoon character in Peter Pan when they put that plank and they used to make, you know, the pirates used to make people walk on it and there were alligators at the bottom just waiting for their lunch. And I just feel like 
that's the plank that we have prepared for ourselves. If you simultaneously look at our uh, pollution policy or the targets for renewable energy and all of that, and then you see what is the reality on the ground, and then you see what kind of uh, forces, social forces are gathered against it, I don't see the plan yet. I see piecemeal. I see people putting up solar farms, people putting up wind farms, putting up people putting storage, but I don't see a comprehensive plan. There's plenty of rhetoric about it. So my hope is that through these educational forums, we can address the policy, the business process, and the technological issues in an intellectually stimulating manner to foster dialogue and not discussion. So this is why I do what I do, and I have to say that the presentation today should stimulate all of you and I'd help you identify your respective roles in this movement. I wouldn't even say this is an initiative. This is a movement, and it, is, it involves active public dialogue, which will eventually have to go to the middle schools and the high schools and the community colleges and the universities and then inspire a whole generation of people to get involved. Now notice the presentation today was on economics and policy. And notice that it stays a bit above the fray of technology and what are the technological requirements that will need to be met in order to meet these types of penetration levels uh, that are going up to 20%. There are data privacy issues that need to be addressed. I think there was a question in the discussion earlier about that. There are cybersecurity issues that need to be worked out. And there are also energy market issues that need to be worked out. Because today, the way we trade for electricity, it's at two aggregate levels. It's a very high level, and it's not democratic enough. So the problem is, where the energy is available and who has it? if we want to move to this virtual power plant concept, which essentially we're going. I mean, the dynamic pricing uh, is a tool. And ultimately, it will work best in an environment that has many, many parties that are involved in energy making and energy consumption. And there has to be certain rules set up in how they will interact. So if you look at the policies today, you will see that there's a disconnect with the vision from the technological and the economics perspective and where the regulatory framework is today. And the disconnect is that the trading of energy is happening at too high a level. And it needs to come down so that we could have whole groups of people that are net energy self-sufficient amongst themselves. Someone may have a solar, someone may have wind, someone may have storage. Another person needs that electricity, and they can locally trade. We don't have that today. And so uh, I'm glad that you brought this subject up about how to create that penetration, because with it, there has to be the technological and business process issues that need to be resolved in order to make this a reality. And we're going to have sessions in the future addressing those various aspects. Next month, on September 18th, we're going to have a presentation by a person who runs a company called Albedo, A-L-B-E-A-D-O. And this will be about business process security. You know, people talk about cybersecurity, but not enough has been said about business process security. And when you're dealing with so many parties, as the future of Smart Grid is showing, you need to have very well-defined business process rules and there has to be the security associated with that. And the person who's going to come, he's going to speak about what is the problem and how we can potentially address that. So keep all of this in mind. One other statistic I want to share from the power of 5%, which was very startling to me. In addition to the $35 billion saving, which you have really up now, isn't it higher now? Well, yeah, it's $7 billion a year. $7 billion a year. So. 140 billion, okay. But the, the statistic I found very interesting in Ahmed's uh, paper on the power of 5% was when he said that a 5% decrease 
in the peak demand brings down the marginal cost of electricity at that peak by 50%. Just think about that. I'm not talking about the whole price, the marginal cost of making that extra iota of kilowatt hours at that point. This is how sensitive it is. So you can now imagine that if we have this kind of cross-subsidization going on today, where people who are not using it in peak time are paying, millions of those are paying for a few thousand that are using electricity at that time, how much of a difference it will make in that reducing that cross-subsidy with each percentage drop in the peak uh, demand. So this, this has to be communicated to people in large numbers, and it cannot be in a hard copy of a newsletter from a utility. It doesn't matter which utility. It needs to be animated. So sessions like this, there needs to be town hall meetings and focus groups, and we need to connect with thousands of people. We cannot think of people as a load, as Ahmed was saying, and saying, oh, if we just communicate something to them, they'll figure it out. This needs to get into schools and programs for energy. So we have energy managers in middle school and high school. Let them inspire their adults to get involved in this. So I am looking at education today, the absence of education as a key barrier in our ability to take what the very bright people in our society are doing and creating and the vast majority of lay people that are wondering, what are these people up to? So it's time for the people who used to get Bs in schools to help out. Tell the people who, are, who got Cs what the people who had As are doing. This is where you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's one of those, hmm. Okay. <laughs> so now uh, for the 20, 25 minutes, we have a short trailer. And then we are going to open it up for questions from the audience and as well as from online. So I'm going to bring up this trailer and see if it will play from this website. Because whatever is happening on the screen, people are able to watch it. And if I go to full screen, I should be able to see it. And the audio is all built into the system. So this is about as high tech as it gets. I'm going to consumers want honest information and the I have to, to make good choices and decisions for their family. I'm aware of the fact that people really, really, really overlook electricity. Most of us don't really think about what it takes to charge that light bulb. My husband and I try to make our house energy efficient. I didn't think about
environmentally conscious. And, and, and it's great to see that they get it. That they get it and, and they're willing to participate. Well, what, um, what's interesting is that, so this, this was done after they did the pilot. Okay, we interviewed these people after they had been part of the pilot. And um, what, we, what we also did was we created pieces from these interviews that could be used to educate people as they, as, as they, they rolled out the programs um, across the district. And, and we, uh, a few weeks ago, did an energy literacy workshop for community-based organizations where we got different groups that were part, that, you know, I mean, anything from AARP to Sierra Club to, you know, people that run foster kid programs or install solar, and we got them to come to PEPCO and we gave them a whole day where we explained sort of principles around dynamic pricing so that they could tell their constituents, you know, kind of what the issues were, that they could come to hearings and be informed consumers. Um, we uh, had a panel of experts so we could talk about issues. We showed them videos that they could use um, in their training sessions. We gave them slides and different things that they could use to talk about it. And it was a very successful day because we, we showed how Smart Grid related to the other energy efficiency things that they were already doing and all the kinds of programs. So, and that when you were talking with different groups, you needed to listen in different ways. You needed to put, put the exchange in their context. Now, how do you want to do the panel okay. given that we're, we've got to stay here? Do we want to right. stand so, here? Uh, yeah, basically I wanted the three panelists to be within audio range and then people can ask questions, and the panelist who it's directed to repeats the question and answers. And you can moderate it. Okay. Because I have to sign all the certificates. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This is the ascending panel. Well, That's the ascending right. ascending panel. Okay. So and so can we see <laughs> what the online question yes, is? Yes. I'm, I'm going to actually get out of this mode. Oh, yeah. See, that, that one there is that green one in the corner. That's, that's the energy literacy workshop. Yeah. That way there's a little video from that that at some point we can look at. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to minimize this one. And I'm going to bring up. Okay. So, oh, yes. I have to end stop sharing. That is bringing me back to this note. Okay. All right. Very good. So, uh, for the people online, this is a good time to start thinking about your questions. You may have some questions from the presentation portion. After you got your carbs and your beverages, you probably were inspired to ask some questions. So this is a good time to post some of those questions. And then for the people in the room, what we're going to do is they're going to ask questions of the panelists. The panelist who they directed to is going to identify themselves, tell the question, and then answer it and I'm going to allow uh, Judith to moderate this panel. So Judith, the floor is yours. Okay, okay so are there questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, Amit, uh, can you offer some insights on uh, why Google pulled the plug on the power meter program about uh, uh, last year after only two years? So the question is why did Google pull the plug on Google Power Meter? Is there anyone here from Google who can answer that question? <laughs> uh, it was actually a surprise to several of us. Um, as you know, Microsoft also had something called Microsoft Home. They also pulled the plug on that. And I, I believe what I've heard, again, from secondary sources is that um, it, it only works uh, if you have a smart meter, number one. And number two, you have to allow access to the third parties to that data. Uh, otherwise, it, it really doesn't 
work. No, I think I think what it was part of it also was that it it required you to enter vast amounts of data. So it was you had to have like a TED device or something in your house oh. to get so and so the thing was that it appealed. So this is the thing that happens in these kinds of things is that it was technical people projecting onto everybody else that other people were going to want to be as technical as they were. And in fact, there weren't enough people who wanted to do that. I believe for the Microsoft Home, it was a case that you had to manually enter the uh, energy data. But for the uh, Google platform, the power meter platform, uh, the data came automatically from the smart meter. Uh, you know, they did, okay, the, the issue was that Home, you had to enter it manually and for the Google one, you could it came from the smart meter. Right. You know, they started doing it before there were any smart meters. Yeah, I think that's what is the they, problem. They were, I mean, that's why I think it was the TED devices. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, that was what yeah. people tended to yeah, tended to have. They had. Can, can, can pull the data automatically. Do you know, Chris? Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, so we have confirmation that it was that they used the TED, there weren't. So that, that, now we have the green button, though. Right, now we have green button, which has a standardized data model that downloads it to your desktop, and you still have to upload it into an application of your choice. So, you know, a lot of the discussion that's happening around green button is what's it going to take before that can become automated. So there, so there was also the issue. Andy Tang said that that they they weren't really working very effectively with the utilities, and that kind of limited what they were able to offer. And Chris has another. So I'm not going to do the whole thing, but basically, it was it spawned a lot of the ideas that came that became Green Button. So it sort of was a valuable, and you know, again, I mean, think about you know the internet in the early days when when you first started. The only people who could build websites for themselves were people who could code HTML, mm -hmm. and if you couldn't code HTML, you didn't create a website. You had to have that skill, and now we have all kinds of tools and things that people can use in very different ways. And I think, you know, again, that to me is why I see this as kind of the beginning of the same kind of thing. Um, question there? Many people don't want to have this much. You know, when you hide, why do you think we live in the area where high-tech people, just look how many people drive their TVs around, one person sitting in a car driving their TVs, and they don't care if it's a motor or bike. So talking about all of this, So, so the comment from the floor is that there are, there aren't that many people who really want to take the time to study this data. Yeah, I, and, I want to comment. And I would that. agree with you on that. That one of the things that that I see in the research that I do is that the people who are the tech enthusiasts represent a tiny, tiny portion of the of the population. And I mean, I hang out with a lot of geeks and. Hardly, you know, I like I pulled like at one New Year's party, and you know there were two people that thought they would want this data, and one of them said he would design his system himself. <laughs> so. Yeah. So what I was going to say was actually I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I mean, all this excitement about hourly data and 15-minute data is is a very very small minority. Uh, most people do not have the time or interest. Uh, there are a lot of utility web portals now, right? Every utility has a web portal, and you can pay your bills. If you have a smart meter, you can look at your load profile, you can download the data, you have green button. But if you really try to find out how many people are actually doing it, 
you find that the number is definitely less than 10%, maybe it's closer to 1% or 2%. And, and then you have within that very small number some who want real-time instantaneous data, and, and that's probably got to be the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. <laughs> I even asked one of those, what would you need that for? And they said, oh, I have an ongoing argument with my teenage daughter about how much power she uses. And so I want to track each and every movement of hers and then show her on this graph what it's doing to our monthly budget. Now, so, now is, is he the same guy who's getting a divorce from his wife? No, no, two, two very different guys on different codes. So I'm going to read the question that came in from, um, that's on the computer here. Uh, okay, from Dick Preston. So while we focus on TOU and CPP, but is there a value offering opt-out load management slash DR, like control of HVAC and other non-essential appliances in place of rates that seem to have a resistance by PUCs and consumers. Um, you know, I think that what, what I've seen in talking to people, I've heard in talking to people around the country is that um, there are some people who are perfectly fine to let the utility make a minor adjustment, especially if it can be a few degrees and not cycle on or off. For other people, that's just an anathema and they wouldn't allow it. So um, uh, earlier, uh, Amit had talked about um, Salt River Project. Um, what they found there was that people really like the routine of the time of use and they're much less enamored in that environment of having someone turn off or adjust their air conditioner. Um, at, at the same time, they also aren't very responsive to CPP rates. So, you know, what you see is that, and this is what Anna talked about before, this idea of allowing people to choose among a set of options, that allows them to pick the one that works for them. So, so yes, I agree, and I, I think the specific uh, question here is intriguing. The, person is saying, um, instead of trying to have rate design being opt out because of the controversies it creates, isn't there another option to have load management programs that control the technology be universally deployed and then if people want to opt out, then you know they can opt out. But the reality is uh, that's much more expensive to do because now you have to install the load management equipment in every customer's premises and then they would have the opportunity to opt out of those. Um, California actually tried it. California has tried just about everything out there. And uh, no surprise to people in this room, I'm sure. So back in 2007 and 08, the California Energy Commission, which by the way is the authority uh, that sets standards for efficient appliances, the minimum levels of air conditioners, the insulation in new buildings and so on, all of that is set by the California Energy Commission through Titles 20 and 24 of the act that created the commission back in 1975 when Governor Brown was the governor the first time around. But they were trying to get into load management standards. And what they would have done then is imposed a restriction that all new homes that would be built would have a smart two-way communicating thermostat in them that could be remotely cycled during times of emergency. So instead of having a, a universal blackout, it would raise the temperature settings by two degrees in some areas depending on the criticality of the power supply demand balance. And uh, proceedings were held. I was part of the consulting team working with the California Energy Commission. We had several people come in, 24 interviews were held. And it was going actually down towards the execution level when suddenly Rush Limbaugh heard about it. And, um, and now uh, you had a lot of people in Central Valley all agitating against it, that this was communism, that this was Orwellian, and this was uh, this was this and this was that. And uh, it, it came to a halt. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, the chairperson of the commission uh, had resigned. Uh, whether there was a connection, I don't know, but it certainly happened soon after that. And one of the commissioners who was spearheading it took a very low profile role. So that initiative was blunted and that's what it would have been. It would have been an opt-out load management program type of a thing for new construction. So even that didn't prove uh, to be that easy to do and it did not involve any rate design changes. So I, I think the issue we have here is on the one hand it becomes an issue of communism and Orwellian. On the other hand, 
it becomes, uh, oh, you, they're going to change the prices, and that's not fair. So if you go towards a market-based solution, which is capitalistic and you would think would be acceptable, that is not allowed. When you go to the other extreme and you impose these standards, then it's communism. So we have that uh, you know, conflict all the time. You, you, you can never get it in the middle of the, the road. So what do you think it's going to take to uh, get uh, uh, Rush or Bill O'Reilly to invite you to be on their program and convince them that this is something they want to get behind? Well, uh, so he's in Florida, right? One of those two, R Rush. And uh, I was actually doing a project in Florida talking about market-based solutions, the things you just heard me talk about. And one person really liked the, uh, the presentations and the ideas I presented. He said, you must be the only Republican in California. And I said, I'm neither a Republican nor a Democrat. I'm an independent. But somehow talk about a market-based approach began to sound Republican. So maybe that's what it'll take to get Rush on board, okay. is to give it that slant. But then uh, if, if Rush likes it, then others won't. I mean, it's sort of you have the po polarization is complete. Um, from the back of the room there? Um, so the, the question is, um, people's, oh. well, people's, the, the comment is that people's um, cell phone bills are much higher than their utility bills, so mm -hmm. what is it going to take to get their attention? And, you know, I think that one of the things that they found, um, the Consumer Utility Board in Illinois found that if they tried to hold a discussion to talk about smart meters and smart grid, they didn't get anybody to show up. But if they took a session where they talked about how to read your phone bill, they got lots of people to show up, and then they could kind of slip in the discussion of smart grid and do it that way. And I think this idea of piggybacking onto um, other, other things that people care about is actually sort of has a lot of merit. Um, today, um, Harold and I were at a meeting a technical workshop at the CPUC, and, and there was a gentleman there from Comcast, and they're, you know, very interested in this space, and I think that it's really, you know, people care about their TV, and they care about their cell phones, and if you, you know, if they were to think that if the, you know, smart meter opponents have their way, well, then they'll outlaw their, their cell phones, too, because, you know, having a, uh, a cell phone to your ear for a 10 minute call is the equivalent of gluing your ear to the smart meter for 34 days straight. So, you know, if people realize that or get afraid that their cell phones are going to be taken away, I think they're going to worry about that a lot more than their meter. So, um, in any I, case. I had a question. Yeah, for, sure. No, I had a question for. No, well, stay in here though. So they can oh, okay. Well, I had a question for Anna. I thought you were going to be... The panel is making <laughs> It's <laughs> fine to me. On the phone continues. I have a loud voice, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, my background's mobile, so I've, I have I draw a lot of parallels into the smart grid industry. My question for you, Emma, was, you know, in Asia and Europe, we've, um, we've had time of use and peak pricing on the mobile side for, mm. for a very long time. Right, indeed. And, and it's impacted the behavior of, of customers tremendously in the way they use, especially the younger audience whose bills are being paid by somebody else. So in your practice, do you even look at the cellular industry as a benchmark in terms of how you could draw learning from that industry to what the work they do in smart grid platforms? Uh, I think you may want to comment on that too, but what I'll say very quickly in our times, uh, just about run out here, is that there is a lot of analogy value in looking at the cellular behavior. A few times when I have described these pricing plans uh, to people who are completely new to the industry, like there was a vice president of a utility who was new in this job, and he picked it up within five minutes. He said, oh, I know what you're talking about because I have seen all those plans in the cellular space, and they're dealing ultimately with the same customer, the same pocketbook issues, uh, and then the analogy kind of stops because people say, oh, but uh, electricity is a necessity, and talking on the phone is a luxury. So we can overindulge in one and cut back as needed as price change 
but for electricity we can't. And that's why there is this huge bifurcation that there is the consumer with the electric brain and there's the consumer with the non-electric brain. It is the same head, but they have two different brains, we are told. And my view is, no, it is the same brain and it's the same person. And it's all about being a sensible consumer of energy. And people look at me and, and they just hate me, you know, for saying that. But the reality is it's hard to deny. I mean, we don't have ten heads, we have one head. No, and, and I think that that's one of the things that we're seeing is that that the integrated conversation needs to be there. The silo approach that the that the regulators have encouraged the utilities to do is not really effective. And, and I think what Irfan was talking about, about the idea of discussion versus dialogue. You know, what I, what I find is that, you know, I've talked to people about this stuff all over the place, and people will tell you what they care about. And then you can frame the discussion from their perspective. And it's very rare to find somebody who won't get in, on board about it if, if, it, if you talk about it from, from what they care about. In the back of the room. So the comment that's coming from the back of the room here is the idea that there are people who are wedded to the technologies that they are familiar with, and it's very hard to ask them to give up something that they know. And I think this is one of the things as you segment audiences and ask people, how do you want to be communicated with? If you're talking to people under 30, um, chances are they are going to want you to communicate with them via text. Okay, and they may not even want you to do email. And if you're talking to somebody who's over 70, chances are there may be a few who text, but probably most of them would, would want either a phone call or an email. Or, so I think the idea that you have different communication channels where you, and different people who are going to want different technology options is completely reasonable, just like there is no perfect car. If I'm going to only allow you to get a minivan, okay, it doesn't matter how nice the minivan is, if that's not suitable for your life, you're not necessarily going to want it. So it's now 7 o'clock. It's, uh, it's getting close to that. Uh, we'll take a few more minutes. Okay. Uh, Chris is very, very accommodating. Uh, Chris Heckert from IBM. Did you want to yeah, I just uh, wanted to correct. When I talked about the um, the Asian countries, I wasn't referring to third world countries, by the way, we call them emerging countries. Um, I was actually talking about um, countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, which are as advanced as this country is, and they were the ones who went first with the time of use uh, pricing. And I agree with you, the other countries, such China, India, leapfrogged in terms of mobile. So, so just a quick comment on Hong Kong, where I was two weeks ago. Uh, I found that bifurcation was there. For electricity, they didn't want it. For cell phones, they seem to want it. So we have to bridge this gap. And you know, I think one thing you said was very correct, which is that because it's regulated in the US, and because we have this intervener process, it becomes a fishbowl setting. Okay? So now it's a political football, and it's no longer market-driven, it's no longer consumer needs-driven. And it takes on a different character that's unlike any other industry's character. And that's where the problem comes in. So in a, now we have enlightened regulators, we have people who look ahead, and then we have people who don't look ahead. So it also depends on which state you're in. Now talking about the South and the Midwest, you know, people shop for airfares, whether they're in the South or the Midwest. They shop for hotels and rental cars, and they absorb the shocks of dynamic pricing happily for those other applications. When it comes to electricity, suddenly, oh, I'm going to go to the commission and complain. This is not something I want. This is southern comfort, or this is midwestern discomfort, or whatever it is. It, it becomes like a peculiarly Dickensian kind.
kind of phenomena that's never seen anywhere else. So, so one of the ways, and I'll, I'll get these last questions here, but one of the things that all of you, if you want to have power in this arena, when there's a CPUC hearing, go and testify. One of the things that happened, uh, that happened at one of the last public hearings was um, the anti-smart meter forces organized 60 people to come to the event. And you had people standing up and saying that smart meters were a crime against <laughs> humanity and things like that. <laughs> and so if, if the only people they hear are these overwrought people who make these you know, grandiose statements and they don't hear from people like you who have educated yourselves to understand the issues, then you know, you're the public too. And so go and make your voices heard and I think it could have a tremendous impact even though I know it's difficult to get people to take the day off from work for something that they agree with. So um, the, in the back there, Mike, and then, Mike. And then you. Mike. So I, I think part of the problem, not part, maybe a very substantial part of the problem, is how the public has been socialized to a certain rhetoric. And you touched on it, I think, perfectly, that electricity is a, quote, necessity, whereas something <coughs> else is a luxury. Quote, luxury. Mm -hmm. Breaking, we have a similar problem. You say that that's unique. I think it's not. I think we have the same problem with medical services. We think that medical services are somehow different than food, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we have to call one special and, and uh, protective and regulated in some way, whereas another one isn't. So the, so the, the, the person raised the issue was that, you know, sort of what happens well, with medical. We, we don't, in medical services, we don't use the market to really determine prices. We have this funny way that we, that we if you break your arm, you don't just go to the doctor and, and pay a, a market price to get your arm set. Well, you do you if you don't have insurance. Well, <laughs> so that's the point. Most people, though, are completely isolated from the pricing mechanism because of the insurance. I'm just saying that there are parallels to the dynamic pricing proposal or market pricing proposal for electricity and other commodities that uh, <coughs> once you've been, once the public has been socialized for decades yeah. against thinking about the commodity of the commodity of those terms, you have that entire history to overcome, which which is a formidable challenge. So I don't have a question, I just have an observation. Okay, just a quick comment. Yeah. I think what you were saying, I'll, I'll just say that, that many people want electricity to be free, and uh, some people want water to be free, and I've had a huge debate, they want water to be free because they say it's a natural resource, it's God-given. At least with electricity, you can say, no, it's not God-given, you have to produce it. So, so but, but, but there is the entitlement mindset, and I think that's what we are up against. It, it, it's, uh, to use another metaphor, it's a sacred cow. And how do we deal with that issue? So, in order to, <laughs> I'd like to uh, bring some structure to this forum and conclude it with some takeaways for our audience online as well as the folks here in the room. Because quite often we are involved in a lot of rhetoric and we're all quite very bright people. The Bay Area has amazing people. And what happens is that we talk we shake our heads on things that are really three sigmas away from what we consider normal, rational, logical, and then we all go home. So what I'd like to do is challenge the audience here, and I have uh, two individuals here who have played a very active role in the uh, specifications of smart grids, the testing of smart grid technologies, and you know they're both looking at me going, hmm, I know who he's talking about. So. What I'd like to do is end it on a positive note. And so Chris and Andy, if you could come to the front of the room. What I'd like to do, uh, now Andy and Chris uh, have both worked in the utility industry and now they are in the private sector. They've looked at this problem from multiple perspectives and they were instrumental in creating a lot of the forums that we now enjoy uh, at the national level that are helping uh, further accelerate this standardization process and get vendors to then uh, test 
their technologies to make sure that they're in compliance with those standards. So the question I want you to answer uh, to conclude this forum is, in your opinion, you've heard the presentation from Amos Baruchi that talks about the resistance to different pricing plans. But give us, from your perspective, some of the technological and business process challenges that we need to address from your perspective in order to allow for these pricing plans and the whole smart grid to become more of a reality and less of this connoisseur fantasy that it is at the moment. I mean, I think I think the first thing. So I I spent four years at PG&E, but my whole career has been Silicon Valley startups, and I, I did a stretch at Intel as well. So I've, I've had the perspective of technology, and I've gone and it was focused on telecom and internet. And so I've, I've gone through those, and I've also I like to think I'm a student of the history of technology. And in reflecting, I think a lot of the things we see happening in this industry are no different than the early days of the in infancy of telecom and the internet. Um, you know, comments like there will there will never be no there will never be more than one or ten PCs in the world. Um, packet switching will never scale, right? It's all circuit switch. So yeah, the original the cellular. Of IBM. Yeah, said, said by the high, high, height of ABM, AT and T had the opportunity to acquire all the internet DARPA pr um, intellectual property at no cost. So. I the original cell phone models had penetration rates at two percent, and the bankers said that'll yep. never get funded. You'll never hit two percent. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so, so I think I think we're just on another curve, and we're at the very beginning of it. And I think the key, what we are seeing, is we've gone over the past five years from a point where it was a very vertical, very utility-centric model. Where now we're talking about standards. We've defined standards. The concept of interoperability and standards and interfaces and the definition of those in the industry, which then allows Silicon Valley to innovate, this is happening. And so the key for companies and startup companies and big companies is to find the component to build value, to build technology that can be monetized against a small problem. Don't, don't, don't solve the giant problem. And you know some of the things we're doing, and it's a much longer discussion, are focused on that, but there, there, are, there are many, many companies that are levering this evolution of standards, that are building devices and products and systems that solve problems that are being monetized, that are being sold to the utilities, that are being sold to the munis, um, that are being sold to the aggregators, that are being market to marketed directly to consumers. So I'm highly encouraged, right? I see great activity. I see all of this um, revenue that is, everybody will always pay their bill, being more and more directed into high-tech companies, into innovative companies, and fueling what I believe is going to be a you know a highly opportunistic engine for the whole economy, and you know, ultimately it will drive value. It'll drive down um, the cost of energy. It'll allow us to all to all be more efficient in energy. So you know, yeah. hopefully that was kind of high level and macro, but it maybe it answered your question. So I'll change the question a little oh, bit so okay. that yeah, so more okay. people, uh, you won't have to duplicate what Chris control. is saying. Yeah. <laughs> Real-time question modification. <laughs> so if you look at it like an industrial research, you know, operations research kind of problem, you know, with like linear programming, mm -hmm. there are certain constraints that we have. Uh, we have certain constraints on building centralized plants now because they're saying, you know, as much pollution as they're going to create, you have to show savings somewhere else in that pollution so that the carbon and and other SOX, NOx gases, and all that are controlled. So that's one constraint. On the other side, we also have uh, the just the rising cost of fuel. Uh, it's just costing more to produce electricity. The demand for electricity, even corrected for the recession, is still going up. And the reason well, why... The long-term view yeah. is that it'll still go up. Yeah. We but, took a little setback. Right, but it, some of it is being offset by people moving to plasma screens and, and getting more energy-intensive things in their homes. We're getting into a society that's increasingly getting more electric. More devices. More devices. More, devices. more parasitic losses you know, from yeah, electronics. We, we, we're, we're consuming energy at a rate that exceeds our ability to build new generation or transmission lines. Right. And, and so near-term near margins go to zero. So that's a constraint. So when you start putting all of this, uh, what I want to ask you is, now you are a consumer, before you were a, a deliverer and consumer when you worked for PG&E, how do we educate this 
vast population. There's 300 million people of different cultural backgrounds, different value systems. That these constraints are real. This is not a figment of our imagination. And it's not a true street unless we take a particular path, that there, there are these barriers. So how, what forums, what would you recommend that we do so that we can take what we did today and take it to the next level and not just leave it at the level of rhetoric? So, I mean, this is really a very, very large public policy challenge, mm -hmm. right? Because basically this is an industry where nothing gets done unless, unless public policy is made. And ultimately the utilities are a, are, you know, they are a natural monopoly. They're probably the, the only remaining natural um, monopoly out there, right? You know, when we were looking at rate design, and Ahmed actually helped us, um, I ran the, uh, uh, one of the things I did in addition to smart meters was actually looked at the uh, at dynamic pricing. I ran the dynamic pricing rates. And one of the things we thought about doing was essentially creating a scenario where you had what we would call training wheel rates, right? Where you would make the price responsiveness trigger um, somewhat de minimis in the, in the early years and then kind of start ratcheting it up as you get customers more accustomed to it. Um, I, I do think there's a certain pu public policy element, which is, in, and this is what the CPUC actually does try to do and what some of the utility commissions do try to do, which is, you know, when you look at that curve that Ahmed showed of the people that are subsidizing the other people, when you actually help people to understand that, by definition, the retail electric utility industry today is all based on cross-subsidies. The challenge is, is that you're changing the status quo of what those cross-subsidies are, and people don't like to have their status quo changed, right? But you do have to recognize that the entire business is about subsidies. So, you know, Quite frankly, from a heavy-handed standpoint, you know, if, if you look at it and, and you can actually get comfortable with the fact that the cost, that you can really make some real movement on the societal benefit on the cost to deliver electricity, because this is really what this is all about. Increasing the load factor overall makes it cheaper to deliver each kilowatt hour of electricity that you're actually delivering, right? So at some point, I think politicians have to get brave enough to basically legislate this. The California Commission has actually gone very far in doing that. And the utilities have been fighting it, but over time the battle gets whittled away, right? When I was at PG&E, one of the things we were doing is we were, we were um, reluctant participants. The commission was really um, trying to drag us there. And of course, in fairness to the utility, you know, the utility gets the customer ire, not the, not the CPUC, not the Public Utilities Commission. The utility gets the ire. The utilities are a very unique business model. I spent four years at pg and also. Chris and I overlapped three and a half of those four years. Um, but I, I, I come from a background of, of private sector as well. And, you know, I've never been in a business model where there is no upside and all downside. And that is the utility business model, right? So when you actually bump into utility execs, you, you can understand their behavior because they are not rewarded for doing anything good. They are only... Um, What's the opposite of reward? They're only punished for doing things incorrectly. Or status quo is safe. Status quo is very safe. Um, but I do think that the movement is happening. I also think, I have a controversial view, which is if, if these commissions actually just implemented and okayed, opt out, um, opt out, but you know, not very, uh, time, uh, not very um, harsh signal between peak and off-peak, but if they just implemented TOU, 98% of the customers would have no idea that that happened. Because the reality of the matter is, is that at least 98% of the people out there don't engage with their with electricity, don't think about it, don't don't give it a second thought. And a comment was made about you know the price of an electricity bill is not high enough, uh, you know not even higher than your uh, than your cell phone bill. And I don't know, but you know in this state that's actually I'd like to know where you live because in this oh, state that's it. actually really hard to do unless you live in San Francisco proper. <laughs> Really hard to do, right? Average utility, average residential utility bills are triple digits, which you know, I mean, when you go across the country, that doesn't exist, yeah. right? Yeah. Utility bills across the country are what, thirty bucks, well, fifty bucks, seventy dollars. But I mean, here you clearly, I mean, where I live, they're like three hundred dollars in the summer now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, one of the things and that the so I think the bills are high enough for the most part, right? Of course, another problem is is that is you know with rate is a problem with rate design, which is PG&E has multiple climate zones in their service territory, right? It is not uncommon for a 2,000 square foot house in Bakersfield or Fresno, California to have an average summer bill of $500. Just think about that for a minute. 
$500, 2,000 square foot home. This is not an excessive, this is not a, a McMansion, right? Not unusual. That same 2,000 square foot home in San Francisco, the utility bill in the summer might be $12. Is that fair? Well, I don't know. Well, if you're picking a litter. Anyway, so so back to your 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 question. I mean, you know, it, it, in my mind, it does boil down to this policy issue, and in my mind, it also boils down to tools for utilities to get better at communicating what's actually happening, especially when you start talking about time varying rates, because consumers don't like to get blindsided at the end of the day. And. What type of forums would you recommend to get the word out? Apparently, the hard copy newsletter is not working. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm an advocate of doing, right? I, I mean, I think you, you can talk all you want, but when you, pr when, you, when you build technology that provides this value that people like, you know, that's, that's what people talk about and they start using it. So you've got to solve the problem, and you have, to, you have to define a solution that can be monetized today and then grow over time. So it's... You know, it's it's applying technology to the problem and doing it, and that, that's not easy, right? It's 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 easier, much easier said than done. But there's a lot of companies doing stuff, providing value. So, I'm you know, and then and you talk in the forums and, and uh, some of these like here and other places. So. Well, and I actually think there's something interesting going on right now. P you know, pg and is is rolling over customers to peak day pricing, which is a a uh, essentially a um, a critical peak pricing program for their for their business customers. They were mandated by um, the commission a couple years ago to actually roll over all of their business customers all the way down to SMB, small and medium business. And of course, the concern was was that the small and medium businesses were going to get crushed by this. Um, they're they're in the process of rolling it out, and you know what? You don't hear about it. The negative comments have not have not flown. I mean, it it, it, it would appear it would appear that you know some of the concern that they had may have been a little bit overblown. Right. So back to Chris's point, roll it out and see what happens. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Some concluding remarks before we adjourn. Our next event is going to be on September 18th, and it's going to be on business process security for smart grid. And uh, the person who will be speaking, his name is Partha Data Ray, and he's from a company called Albedo, which is a startup company that will talk about this. And you've heard of Alert Enterprise and companies like that who are involved in this area. So this is a whole different aspect of cybersecurity than what you're normally used to when you talk about cryptography and authentication and things like that. This is more about how do you make sure that all the parties that are going to be involved in this new marketplace will securely communicate with each other. What does it take in terms of setting up that process? So uh, be on the lookout for my invite for that. It'll, that the program starting next month are going to start at 5 p.m. And from 5 to 6, we're going to have a networking break first. And then at 6 p.m., we'll start and run till 7.30. And that will give people an opportunity to get here <coughs> after they finish their regular jobs. Okay. So, yes, a uh, question. Uh, do, you, from do you know the location of that meeting? It's here. It's always here. Yes. Thanks to uh, Chris. And there may be even pizza, I hear, in September. Yes. And Mike? Uh, uh, listening to the entire session, uh, uh, Don on me, that uh, obviously we need to uh, have a better understanding on how the consumers, uh, meaning ourselves, be engaged. Yes. So would it be possible for you to start looking at uh, the organizing a session, like uh, I mean, this session today, yeah. uh, discussing what has been done for consumer or customer engagement, and what kind of a, a trend can we plot out and see a potential uh, vector where it's going? Okay. So um, the point, uh, just uh, before we uh, conclude the session, I, I just have uh, a minute or two to uh, seek of your time so that uh, we can conclude this with some positive steps because uh, we have definitely created a lot of momentum here, and I'd like to leverage this momentum. So if, if the folks in the back of the room could just oblige me for just a minute. Uh, so in response to your question, Mike, uh, the, 
the point about bringing in the customer perspective and figuring out how to engage them. So I started that dialogue by asking questions of Andy and Chris on what kind of forums to create, and they suggested that forums like this, maybe some town hall meetings, you know, discussions that can occur at the neighborhood level, and, and bring about this awareness. Basically what it is is about awareness. People make very, very rational decisions when they know what it is that they're doing. Every time they go buy an iPhone or an iPad or an i something and spend lots of money, they figured out the value in their minds or their kids convinced them of the value. And so I don't see smart grid technology as being alien to that process, but it is our job, just like it was Steve's job's job, <laughs> to put out that value proposition. And I think that there will be a gradual process. If there's one thing that came out of the presentation and the discussion today, is that this is not a luxury. This is a necessity. Because the environmental goals and the demand for electricity is moving us in a direction where there has to be a democratization of the energy delivery production delivery mechanism. Dynamic pricing is one tool in that larger cosmos. And we need to understand that that's a reality. Now, there are people who are fearing that. We need to understand their fears and work in ways to bring that fear down through communication and through dialogue, not discussion. We determine that. These types of forums are going to help. But there, there's still a lot of work to be done at the grassroots level and you know people like Chris and others who are working in companies that are coming up with solutions it's very important that they be empowered and that they continue to get funded because my fear is that you know there's that uh, Gartner hype cycle thing going on where you know there's this hype and now we're going into the troughs of disillusionment in order for us to get into the plateau of productivity we need to make sure that the people who invest in these types of ventures know why they're making the investment so they're in there for the long haul and not you know, have quick exits, because this will take time. And there are many, many exciting technologies out there, like the concept of micro data centers, the concept of taking SCADA up into the cloud. I mean, the sky is the limit in the possibilities. And they're all on the cutting edge, and they need funding. These types of ideas need help. And it's not enough just to say, oh, we'll just leave it to DOE to fund this. The private sector has to be involved actively. In the absence of private sector, I fear that the dollars that we're seeing from Washington or from Sacramento will not be enough to sustain what we need for the next 10, 15 years. Forget the 2050 targets. I mean, they're so aggressive. I get scared when I look at those RPS terms. But I'm just saying even 2020. So uh, what we need to do is each one of us has a role as a result of this forum and what we have discussed to think how can you uniquely contribute in this, whether in the policy, whether in the business process and technology. And there's no one more important than the other. They're all important. You know, a lot of times we're driven by technology and like, oh, you don't know technology, you don't know anything. No, it's not the case. The economists are needed, the policy makers are needed, and collectively we have to create this vision and then inspire the vast majority of people in this country and internationally that this is the right way to go. So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming here and participating and engaging in meaningful dialogue. I hope that you will continue this in your own respective careers and try to infuse some of this into your daily life, even if you're not involved in smarter, because we need your talents. You can't just be in that small niche. So thank you very much, and if Ahmed could come to the front of the room and open the computer again with his Houdini moves. The secret password. The, yeah, the secret password, then I can bring this session to an end. Thank you. All right, and with that, for the folks online, the six of you who are there, I am now ending the recording. Thank you all for joining us today, and good night.